Looking round, I finally see I think I need a change The rat race I wanna flee My world I'll rearrange I'm getting back to the roots Of how it's meant to be Growing gardens, picking fruit Racing livestock, living free Well, hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. My name is Harold Thornbro, and I'm glad you're joining me today. And today I got a, a return guest, uh, Jordy Buck, is joining us again to uh, talk to us about some new projects on his homestead. How you doing today, Jordy? You're- doing good, busy, and a little lack for sleep, but doing good. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the homestead way, man. But you got new additions to the family and uh, a lot of work going on around there. So yeah, yeah that can uh, cut into the old sleep schedule a little bit, can it? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, last time you were on, you told us about your little one acre homestead and all the things you had going on there. And if folks don't remember that, uh, this is a few weeks ago, uh, I guess probably three or four months ago now you were on and um, you got a one acre homestead in Michigan uh chickens uh pigs what other livestock did you have is that oh you had rabbits too i believe didn't you yep okay Mm -hmm. and uh you do some market gardening and yeah i mean just giving everybody kind of rundown but one thing that a lot of people um uh noticed about that episode was that you were growing a lot of your own feed for your livestock not only was you market gardening to supply some income for the family but and, and for the homestead you were also um growing a lot of your own feed and i guess today what we're going to oh, talk yeah. about is kind of an expansion on that you've been a lot of your um mm-hmm. one acre was wooded so you're let's why don't you tell us about your new project there and what you're doing well i'm working on uh clearing out the last of my acre here now so originally um half of my front yard was wooded the the, the front and back is basically equal both half an acre with the house in the middle so we've we got the front all cleared out and I've finished ripping the stumps out uh, just this past fall as the snow started coming. So we've got that ready to go. And I got the pigs through there just to help clear it up and fertile the ground. And we're going to be planting a perennial pasture over there. That's going to be perennial pasture crops for animal feed mainly. But now we're working on the back, which is another half acre of trees. Um, Boy, there's a lot of trees back there for for just a half acre doesn't sound like a lot but when you start looking at densely grown old forest full of trees i mean every 10 feet is a mature tree back there so i've got about 35 36 trees down and mostly split right now and i'm taking a break there's (laughs) a lot left to go yeah uh well you're kind of doing things the hard way, uh, a good way, but a hard way. Um, in the sense that what, one of the things yeah. I admire about you is that you, um, you're not playing this game where you're just trying to keep up with the Jones. You're not buying things you don't absolutely need to have. You're making do with a vehicle that, you know, you're not out buying a new truck and you're not out spending a lot of money on things that aren't an absolute necessity. And, and that even includes when it comes to, to dropping trees, right? You're, you're not using chainsaws to drop them. I watched a video yeah. with, doing it with an ax. So I did. I did at least the first 20 just with an ax. Um, Mm -hmm. I ended up getting a chainsaw for now. I did a trade with my neighbor, three cords of wood for one of his old chainsaws. So I do have that now. Awesome. I mean, I don't mind dropping them with an ax, but when you're, when you're trying to cut them up into smaller pieces, that's, that's the problem. I mean, right. I was was going to ask you about that. Just ridiculous with an ax. Yeah, I've done that before um, with softer trees, mainly with fir and poplar, where I axe them down and then I cut them into something like 12 foot lengths or 15 foot lengths with the axe and then just split them into rails, basically, with a hammer, a wedge and an axe. Get them skinny enough and you can just chop them up into functional pieces for firewood. And that's what I used to do. But now I've, i mean i've got at least another 40 or 50 trees to go so mm-hmm. i'm using a chainsaw now after i got one it just took a little while yeah 
now your chop when you cut these down you're leaving those stumps up a little ways i've noticed that i've seen you cut a few what are you doing yep. with that when you are you just leaving yeah. those and kind of letting everything your animals kind of run around that or what do you what, what's the plan there for the most part uh when i first started doing that i left the stumps up pretty high because i was using those for fence posts okay. and it worked out pretty nice um to put together well they're strong stout fence posts and if you're dealing with pigs you want some fairly strong fence posts so i did that originally now i'm leaving them oh something around chest high or so both because that's where the axe swings the easiest about that height yeah and because that gives me a lot more leverage to rip out the stumps later on mm -hmm. so if you cut them down real short you have no leverage to to pull the stumps out the yeah. taller stumps put a chain towards the top and you got a lot more leverage to rip them out after the roots kind of soften up in a few years. Yeah. Yeah. I just, when people cut them short like that, generally the plan is just to get like a stump grinder and take them out like that. But yeah, if you're going to want to pull them out, yeah. Having that leverage, your eyes right, is the way to go. So I agree. Yeah. That, it makes a big deal. I found, I mean, trying to, trying to pull out some of the stumps that I cut down real low, that's a pain. It's a lot harder. You got to dig a lot deeper and, it's a, it's a problem. Well, someone might be wondering, well, why are you going through all this work? I mean, that's a, that's a lot of work to clear out of woods to grow some stuff, but, um, it is, but it's in your opinion, it's worth it because mostly what you're going to be growing there is livestock feed, right? Yep. Animal feed. Um, yeah. So I like ha having trees and there's definitely some, some homestead security to having trees, if for nothing else, just for the firewood value of it. But on only one acre, there's only so much I can do. And I finally decided that, well, I can't do quite everything. So I might as well do a few things pretty good. And growing livestock feed is a bigger deal to homestead security than having trees for potential firewood. We don't even really have a wood stove right now. I just burn a little wood in the greenhouse and sometimes in my shed when I'm out there for a while. Mm -hmm. So, so for, for animal feed, livestock feed, um, I mean, my whole front is completely used up right now, hundred percent between the market garden and a little bit of, of pasture crop on each side of that. There's, there's no more space at all. Um, and we're trying to increase what we're doing, uh, mainly with the rabbits. I love rabbits. They're, they're such efficient animals mm -hmm. to handle, yeah. but they eat a feed. One breeding rabbit doing about four litters a year will go through somewhere between 500 and 600 pounds of feed in a year. Mm -hmm. And that adds up pretty fast. You know, we're, we're talking getting 10, 15 rabbits going and selling more of the meat. That's a lot of feed. Yeah. So well, then the question is, how much can we really do on a half acre? You know, how much feed can we grow? And that's variable, very, very variable. Yeah. Um, anywhere between about two and five round bales worth of feed is what I can feasibly grow in my back pasture area. Once I finish with it, depending on how fertile we get it really. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rabbits are great. Uh, and it's, an, or it's an easy animal to replace the feed for, um, forage. I mean, rabbits uh -huh. do great on forage. They do great on just in a lot of crops. Um, they don't, this it's just a, an animal that it's pretty easy to, to make that transition over to that. I mean, pigs can be a little more difficult. Chickens can be, I mean, there's just, you know, how I mean, you can do it with all the animals. I mean, all of them naturally eat what's there. I mean, they, you know, we, we've turned it into like, it's impossible to, uh, grow the food for them, but, um, it's kind of how they're made, you know, to, to just eat what's there and, um, and they'll make do. But, uh, yeah, rabbits I find are super easy to, uh, to do that with. And, um, what made you go with trying to actually grow some crops, uh, ground level crops versus tree crops? Like I know I feed my rabbits, you know, a lot of mulberry. I actually will forage like for willow and things like poplar, things like that. And I find trees really, um, really effective and really, um, productive for, for, um, having food for my rabbits and i think it's a good way to go what made you think or decide to go with more of a, a ground crop than a tree crop well there's a couple things to it uh, first off is the fact that the past five to six years we've had really bad problems with gypsy moths mm. 
I mean, very bad to the point where, I mean, mid-June, usually in mid-June, we have a fairly full mast of leaves on the trees, but they were basically gone completely and all had to regrow. Oh, wow. So, and that, uh, the stress of all that, I mean, what I liked best about the trees is things like nut crops and acorns, that kind of thing for their oil value and their protein value for the animals. But we can't get any of those crops because the trees are too stressed out from the from the gypsy moths and trying to regrow their leaves every spring. Mm, okay. And it, it, It's been very hard. And I know those kind of things come in seasons and kind of go in waves where you'll have bad years and then you'll have several good years. But it's a been enough problem that that's really kind of what put me over the edge to go ahead and take down and at least all the mature trees out here. And I mean, we're talking large, you know, 75 foot, 100 foot tall poplar and oak. And yeah. so big trees. The other part is I can't really go out and take leaves off of my big, tall trees that well. Right. So we were doing that with some of the smaller stuff, some of the more brushy trees and the small mm -hmm. stuff. But most of what's out there for the past five, six years, I've gotten very, very little, if any, use out of. Um, so I decided, well, I'm going to go ahead and replace that with something that at least can't have the gypsy moth problem. And the only crops I really know that have never really had pest problems is just a standard pasture crop. More or less wild pasture is what mm -hmm. we're going to start with, just because I'm assuming once I get all these trees cleared out, we're going to have a lot of wild perennial growing just a lot of weeds and chicory and whatnot so i'm just going to kind of let those grow at first and just work with those until we get the ground a little better conditioned and a little more used we're going to put the pigs back there and just have them work up the soil help get rid of the brush that's going to start growing out and clear up a lot of the little sucker trees that are going to come up yeah. and eventually i'm probably going to actually seed something like an alfalfa back there mm -hmm. but for now we're just gonna you know just Keeping it simple, we're going to be doing just a, a wild pasture crop out there, a perennial pasture crop. And I am planting some trees, but I'm going to be going with, for the most part, more of a, more smaller trees or at least things that I can keep small and keep contained. So I actually have a diagram here, but it wasn't showing up good in my camera earlier. So okay. in the backyard, I'm planning on putting trees, uh, mainly fruit trees, orchard trees around two of the sides of my back, the sunnier sides, because my backyard is surrounded by forest. So it's got some shade problems to it. So I'm going to be putting up orchard trees, about 12 to 13 orchard trees, all different types of fruit trees, and just around the sunny two sides of my property. But I've got to keep those a little bit smaller. I don't want them overgrowing and overshadowing too much because I already have a little limited light back there. Mm -hmm. So, and that's again, mainly for animal value, because I'm not going to be trying too hard to keep them sprayed and keep the bugs out of the apples and pears and whatnot. So yeah. it's mainly for the feed value of those sugars and starches that I can get. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. You got to kind of, yeah. I mean, sometimes you just have to start over. Yeah. Things grew out of hand. You kind of, you're just basically taking mm -hmm. it back to, to kind of build it the back the way you want it to be. And yeah, have those trees have like, you know, like some of those great fodder trees, uh, a tree, hay trees that will feed your livestock and not just your rabbits, but your pigs and chickens can eat that stuff as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, get those where you want them so you can control the sunlight. Um, I, I mean, I find like getting around the border, opening up the South facing side so you can get the sunlight in, but get them on the other parts, you know, or maybe just sporadically have them where you get that, that spotted sunlight throughout the day on a pasture or whatever, where it's not just all, all day long. And, um, yeah, take advantage of that as well. And some of those trees go really fast, like poplar and like the hybrid poplars and the mulberry willow, those trees grow yeah. crazy fast. So, um, I mean, you wouldn't be waiting, but a couple of years anyway, to get the benefit from those. Yeah. If you're waiting for fruit, it takes a lot longer with fruit trees, but if you're just looking for tree crops, like for tree hay for the, for the leaf product for your animals, the, you get that pretty fast, especially with uh, the hybrid poplars and the mulberry, you get that super fast. So yeah, yep. I think it'd be great. Now, I might put in, um, I might put in a, a, a decent row of uh, poplar just for a fodder crop, at least temporarily. Before any any other crops are very well established, I might do that for a few years. 
and then just see how it goes. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of wild poplar around here, and I'm probably going to use that versus getting a hybrid poplar. Or I'm, I just saw a few places where I can buy large bundles of the hybrid poplar cuttings. And yeah. my father-in-law is very good at uh, rooting tree cuttings. That's his hobby, rooting yeah. cuttings and then selling the little the little small trees so maybe get a few tips go. from him yeah. and see if i can't either take my own cuttings from our trees that are still around here or buy a bundle of cuttings and just plant them somewhere see how they go i mean shucks i know everybody says that the hybrid poplar grow so fast but the poplar grow awful fast too yeah if you've got the if fastest you've already got them trees there. around here yeah. uh, the only thing that comes close is the mulberry yeah. Yeah. If you've already got them, yeah, I'd say use them uh, for sure. I mean, it's a, it's a money saving thing. Plus they're adapted to your area really well. So they're probably, you know, you're going to have something that's just going to do well where you live, which is, which is important. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't see nothing wrong with that. I mean, yeah, if you're buying trees, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, yeah. Going out and getting the hybrid might be a good idea, but yeah, when you got use what you got, that's why I was, it's like you can buy all these uh, like mulberry. Yep. You know, I, I look at all these mulberry uh, varieties out there, and they got all kinds of you know different ones with real long mulberries, or they got like the different um, uh, like the the dwarf ones and all these different ones. And I'm like, yeah, we just got like red and white mulberry here, and it grows everywhere. I just dig it up and replant it where I want it, you know. And it's like <laughs> I, I just don't see no sense in going out and buying it. I mean, there's advantages. There is there's slight mm -hmm. advantages, but when it's free and it's there yeah, take advantage of it for sure yeah that's something i think is it's too often overlooked is um what nature's already trying to give you just sitting around i mean right. I, I looked at some mulberry trees for sale you know like little 12 inch tall trees and they're 35 36 37 bucks for one yep. or i could go to my parents backyard and pull out about a hundred of them every spring and, and nothing, bring them over nothing transplants Actually, that's where takes off as easy a yeah. few of my mulberry trees came from yeah yeah i I've, have uh black mulberry and white mulberry from my parents backyard and i just found one mulberry in a smaller one in the far back of my property clearing trees out here don't know what it is yet i'll find that out later but i'm going to leave that mulberry because it's right about where i wanted to plant some fruit trees anyway and, and i'll tell you if you're not if you are growing them for fodder I find just keeping them uh, coppiced mm -hmm. and every year and just because they get really bushy and they put off a lot more leaf that way. You won't get hardly any fruit, if any. But, you know, if you just cut them down every year and let them grow back and they just get thicker and thicker and thicker and you get a huge leaf crop off of them. And, um, yeah, I just that's mm -hmm. the way I do mine for the rabbits. And I got one right outside the rabbit pen that every year I think is cut down almost the ground. And, um, man, it comes back so bushy every year and it ends up being 20 feet tall by the end of the summer and it's just got so much leaf product on it for those rabbits and the sticks they eat the you know they eat the branches the small branches and stuff too and yeah they love it and um yeah it just makes that one tree feeds a ton of rabbits <laughs> believe it or not it you know and that with what other forage i give them yeah i can keep them keep them pretty uh pretty filled up um yeah but i like what you're doing there now i seen that you were talking about getting in a front porch facebook group the other day you were talking about getting some uh comfrey going and you were talking about using the com the common oh, yeah. country in that pasture more than the balking mm -hmm. varieties because you want it to spread. And, and I've always said that is the proper use of common country. If you've got a pasture area that you're wanting to run things through and you don't care how much it produces, that's the place for that. Yep. So I bought, um, I was hoping I could find some real bulk packs of seeds. I couldn't really just, uh, mm -hmm like a little pinch in seed packets. So I'm going to be starting it in uh, my plug trays and my 200 plug trays. Since I know that it, it can be invasive in a lot of situations, but my back pasture here, besides it's completely covered off by trees all around for half a mile in all directions is trees back there. Yeah. And then the front, my house blocks 75% of it. So it's, it's going to be quite easy to contain where it is. And I don't mind something that's a good, useful crop growing like a weed. Yeah. I mean, it does. I've, I've actually never grown that variety of you know, the common variety. I've stuck with the balking varieties, but I think that that variety is what you want for a pasture crop, for a crop where you're going to be turning animals loose, yeah. or, you know, letting them forage uh, or just harvesting a lot of forage for them. It's, it's the proper use of that mm -hmm. plant. 
Uh, I would never want that even close to my garden area. Just, I wouldn't. I mean, it could just fill your garden up and you'll never get rid of it. Um, I know Rachel uh, has to deal with that a lot because she went with the common comfrey on her property. She's got a small property and it has just been invasive, really. But in in the proper setting, it is the it is what you would want. And if, yeah, if I had acres of property or even just a big pasture area where I was going to run animals through, I mean, you don't want to be out there trying to manually separate and spread the, the, you know, the crowns and placing them everywhere. You want something that's just going to do the work for you. And that's, that's the proper use of that. Yep. And I'm going to tell you, comfrey is a great, great plant. I mean, the, the rabbits love it. I'm sure your pigs and your chickens will love it. Um, and it's just, it's really high in all kinds of nutrients and protein and, um, yeah, it's just a great crop. It's one I really like, and it's just, it wants to live. It wants to grow. It wants to spread. Um, so it's just a, it's an easy one. It's a really easy one and worth having. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, yeah. something that will hopefully kind of outcompete the grass. <laughs> well, it definitely does that. It'll shade it right out. Um, now you said something about growing more traditional crops like alfalfa, right? So are you going to, um, just, yes. how, how would you, how would you give that to your animals? Are you talking, are you thinking about making your own pellets with that? Or are you thinking just direct feed, you know, in, in the, the crops to them? So eventually I would like to start playing with a pelleter. Yeah. That would be, um, yeah. I have this crazy idea down the road of, of doing like small batches of specialty animal feed for sale. It's kind of one of the things I've always wanted to get into, Yeah. but for right now, I mean, just through the warmer months, just going harvesting by hand, getting a, a good arm load every few days to feed the rabbits, give a little to the chickens and pigs that way. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm going to be experimenting with, with, um, doing some silage, actually small scale silage. I've got some 60 gallon barrels with screw on lids that I bought here in town. And we're going to be experimenting, seeing how we can make it work, packing those full and saving it for more of a fall and winter feed as a silage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And like getting into any fermenting of, of, of that or anything like that, or. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah, I know that the, it just seems the digestion, you know, assists in the digestion a little bit and a uh, little healthier animals a little bit, but yeah, good stuff there. Um, so, so that's the plan, uh, some ground crops, uh, comfrey, alfalfa, whatever grows kind of naturally, pick and choose the trees you want around the kind of the borders or where you want them to provide tree crops. Um, have you ever, have you ever done tree hay before as far as just like removing limbs and then storing them for winter? I've never stored it. Um, we've yeah. harvested a lot and fed it fresh mm -hmm. quite a bit, but I've never actually stored it. Um, it's really kind of the problem around here is I don't have a whole lot of space for, yeah. for any like traditional hay storage where you store it indoors. I know I've seen tree hay being stored outdoors several times, yeah. so I might try and give some of that a try just as it goes. Uh, but I mean, that's why we're looking at doing like a, a small scale silage type setup for, for the, uh, pasture haze that we're going to be harvesting going forward, just because for storage, I couldn't think of any better way to store it other than doing like a silage in barrels, just, just as a method to store it. So it stays good for a while so that we yeah. have it for a fall and winter and early spring feed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, we've talked about the kind of the, what your plan is. Let's talk about why the plan. <laughs> You're, let's talk about the level of importance you place on feeding your animals from your property. Yeah. How, how important is that to you and why? Yeah. It's a big deal to me. And I think that in more cases, it should be a, a more prevalent or pressing concern for folks. Number one is. It's just because you can. That's that's the first reason I give folks is because you can and it's fairly simple, which means more people can do this. That's mm -hmm. the big barrier to entry for a lot of folks into homesteading with animals is feed costs. I mean, yeah. everybody everywhere go to any Facebook group, group or forum. They're all talking. About feed. Oh, my goodness. You don't see. And if you can produce at least some of that yourself, you're greatly uh, lowering the barrier to entry for a lot of folks. So mm -hmm. there's, there's that just kind of as a general, but also as the feed security or homestead security uh, aspect of it, I am 
somewhat prepper minded. I don't go too crazy out there, but I'm in a few at a local prepper group and and just the fact of realizing that things can go bad sometimes, you know. Yeah. Um I can't always get out in hard times. I'm not going to be able to go and buy cheap corn and cheap alfalfa pellets for my animals. You know, um that's some of the first stuff that gets restricted during hard economic times. I mean, food starts going more towards actual people consumption instead of for uh, pet and livestock use as much. And something like um, this drought that we had this past year, I mean, that increased the feed costs in the area by about 50, 60, 70 percent. Yeah. And if I was trying to to make a buck or at least break even raising my pigs on a hog feed, there's no way I could have done it. Most right. of the guys I know doing small scale, raising small scale pigs for sale for meat pigs, they all, a lot of them actually lost money just because they, they couldn't put their prices up high enough, fast enough to keep up with feed costs last year. And their margins are so slim anyways. So yeah. having a more stable and a more secure setup where I can produce at least a portion of our own animal feed or what I'm attempting to do is grow all of our own rabbit feed. It's going to be tough because we're starting to get a lot of rabbits, but I think I can do it, <laughs> but can do it. it's a big deal as far as um, a level of security and a surety that I can continue doing what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And another reason I've always been big on it is because I know what I'm, I know what my animals are getting too. you know, um, when I grow it, that I too, know it's a healthy too. feed for them. Yeah. It's, it's like, I don't know, I don't know everything that's in there and I don't know what it's been sprayed with. And a lot of times you have to worry. I mean, you might be buying a commercial feed. Now I feed it to my rabbits, but then I plan on using that manure where there's a lot of sprays that'll pass right uh -huh. through an animal into their manure. Then you go to put that on your garden and now you got a problem. So when I grow up myself, it's yeah. Not oh yeah. Yeah. So that's another one for me. And yeah, you're right. Yeah. Feed that's costs, a big one. Health of the animals, health of the product you're getting from the animals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a lot of reasons. And now, you know, I don't get too tied up in all the conspiracy theories, but there are a lot of, there's a lot of talk <laughs> yeah. out there right now about, oh no, the feed's not uh -huh. got as much nutrients in it and your chickens aren't laying and this and that. And I don't know. I don't know. There's people swearing by it. There's people <sighs> saying you're crazy. I don't know. But you want to know one thing I do know? If I grow my own feed, it's something I don't have to worry about, period. So it's not an issue. <laughs> yeah, I will say that especially having some fresh fodder crop for, for any of the animals, I mean, pigs, rabbits, chickens, goats, mules, whatever you have, if you have some fresh vegetative fodder crop that you can go and pick and give to them, they are going to be a much more vibrant, active and healthy animal mm -hmm. just because of the, um, the some of the natural natural bacteria that are on the fresh live plant matter and the high, high levels of uh, vitamins that are only found in the very fresh material. And uh, it, it makes the animals so much more healthy and strong and vibrant. Oh, yeah. Yep. I agree. I've seen it. Yeah. Uh, when I, you know, there's a, there's a season or time when, you know, I've raising like all my, even on these smaller livestock, like my rabbit and my quail, you know, all in cages doing their thing. You know, I would give them a lot of, you know, I try to always give them some, you know, fodder from the yard. Just mm -hmm. I'd go out and harvest for them and bring it to them here and there. But when I put them in trackers on the ground and move them every day where they're actually eating from the ground every day, it's a world of difference. The animals just look healthier. They grow faster. They, it is. They're happier. I mean, there's just something about them that's different. And it's it's just not the same animal. And then I feel better about it because I'm letting those animals be more like they're meant to be, of course, you know. But, um, yeah, they, it, they just eat better and they act better and, and they look better and everything mm -hmm. about them is better. And, yeah, I agree 100%. Yeah. It seems to reduce their, their stress load. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the way I put it. It reduces their stress load. It makes them kind of more comfortable and happy. And I use the term vibrant a lot. It makes them more vibrant. Uh, um, it, it makes them into a different animal when you give them that option. I know I've seen a lot of the times that they'll grow, they'll gain less muscle or gain muscle more slowly when I put them on that kind of diet instead of mm -hmm. a concentrated high protein ration. But the animals overall are healthier. Yeah, they look. So they, yeah, they grow a little slower. And I've also noticed it, it may may grow a little slower, but uh, when I'm processing animals like that, 
the meat looks better. I mean, it takes them a little longer to maybe get to that size you want, but once you get them there, I feel like it's a healthier meat. The 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 fat ratio just looks better in it. The uh, the liver looks better. Every, the organs themselves look a lot better when you're when you're processing them and stuff. It just they look a lot better. Uh, it just looks like a better meat and better product in the end too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I would rather oh, take yeah. a little bit more it time makes getting a there. Yeah, I'd rather just be a little patient, let them kind of naturally get there, but then have a better have a better product in the end. I mean, maybe if you're doing it for profit. I still think it works out because yeah, you may not be able to make the transition as quick. I mean, cause everybody thinks we'll get them as big as you can, as quick as you can to make that profit. But if it's costing you less to actually get them there because you're feeding yeah. them from forage, then it's, it kind of balances out really, you know? Yep. So I, I was just writing an article uh, yesterday about uh, raising goats and the difference between more of a pasture raised versus a, a, a high protein, high grain concentrated feed just the difference in performance and growth, but also just in cost. And you can go that direction so far into the highest end feeds, but your return is constantly less and less return for more and more cost. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. How long you been ruined? How long you been doing rabbits? You've been doing rabbits for a while, right? Uh, we, I was into rabbits a bit as a young kid. We had rabbits when I was probably six years old. When I was younger, uh, I got back into rabbits maybe seven years ago out mm-hmm. here. And that's when I've been I've you know concentrated on really trying to understand uh, raising rabbits in a more kind of holistic and simple functional manner for about the past seven years. Yeah, last time we talked a lot about your chickens and your pigs, but we didn't spend a lot of time talking about your rabbits. So that's got why I kind of wanted to go there a little bit. I actually feel like as far as an animal that just, when I think about like an animal for self-sufficiency or just preparedness, I don't know if there's anything better than a rabbit. I mean, yeah, when it comes right down I, to it, it's yeah. something you can do just about anywhere and you can produce a lot of meat really fast. Um with rabbits. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, people just don't, I don't think people realize the kind of meat you can put in a freezer <laughs> by raising rabbits. It's pretty amazing really. And they do a lot of the work for you. And, and as we're pointing out, mm-hmm. easy to feed with very little expense. Um, with, I found with rabbits, you have that initial expense, especially if you're doing cages and stuff, you have that initial expense where you're going to have to mm-hmm. build your cages, get your stuff set up. But after that, it's it's a really efficient animal to raise, and uh, and there's different breeds for different things. Oh yeah, but uh, as far as just meat goes, it's a great animal. It's a great animal to have on your homestead. I th- I think the same way about them. I've probably in a dozen different articles on my blog, I've really listed rabbits as kind of the best animal for self sufficient meat production, and they're just they're easy keeping. They're hyper productive. They they have a great feed conversion ratio, and they have a very wide range of applicable feeds that they can do at least moderately well on. They're yeah. they're yeah incredible. The only real expense you, for most people is cages, and a lot of people will buy or build a shed to put them up in. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll tell you what though, you can find really cheap used cages all over the place if you just look. So many people had old rabbit cages in their garage that they're getting rid of for 10, 15 bucks. Yep. I have, uh, I, we just traded a few old bee boxes for seven or eight, three foot rabbit cages. that are all stacked up in my front yard now. Yeah. I bought my initial first cages. Then I built a few, but then I found on Facebook marketplace several years ago, mm-hmm. uh, these people had like show rabbits. They were doing like the, uh, uh, oh, I can't remember the really big rabbits. I can't remember now. Anyway, they were raising those and they had, they had these real long cages they built. It's all like together in one, you know, big, long cages. And I bought the, I bought two of those. So it was, uh, basically it was eight cause there are four, uh, cages on each side. So it was eight holes basically, but they were big, you know, they're like, a like, um, uh, 36 by 36 cages, pretty good size cages. Yeah. Um, but they're all hooked together. It came with the nesting boxes, the water bottles, the feeders. I mean, I got it all. I think I bought them for like 50 bucks for all that, you know, and I was like, that's a good deal. You know, when I first, uh, when I first started with my rabbits here, my first cage was made out of uh, half of a broken door 
three pallets <laughs> and some chicken wire. Yeah. And it worked. Um, I only had two rabbits at the time. I, I found uh, two, two bucks that were the silver fox breed. So I got those and I fed them a diet of mostly squash over the summer, squash and pumpkins and grass. Um, I ended up finding a nice doe. The breed is harder to harder to acquire that breed, the silver fox, but I yeah. found some nice rabbits about an hour south of me. I went down and got a nice breeding doe from there and I needed a better cage. My dad recalled that on some property, he had some vacant land uh, down south of us a ways, and there was one or two old um, four hole rabbit cages down there sitting in the woods, but I had to go find them. So I went down there and they were all grown over and brush growing through them. It was kind of tough to reclaim them, but I got those and we're using those now. I just set them up on a, a metal frame, the uh, frames from those IBC totes. So I've got them up on those for now. Yeah. And the those are four whole cages. So they're, yeah, four, three foot cages in each, each one of those uh, rows of cages that I have. So I've, yeah, we've got quite a bit of rabbit cage space. And then for my rabbit shelter, I was just using kind of a conglomeration of some like boards and whatnot, just kind of over the top of the cages to keep the rain and snow out. I have a uh, carport now that I got from a neighbor because it had collapsed years ago on a windy, snowy day. I just had to fix it up and repair a couple broken legs. And and uh, I got a, a used tarp, actually, from that came from the ballpark in town. They use these big, <laughs> giant tarps to cover up the the soil when it's raining. Yeah. So I got this giant tarp I just had to put grommets in and cover the top of it with. So uh, it's definitely a low-budget operation. But yeah. it works great. I've got the rabbits right behind my house, so there's they they don't get any wind right there. And then just a uh, carport tarp cover over top of them over their cages, yeah. and they do great out there. They're such I, a I, just a hardy and adaptable animal. Yeah, there you are representing the frugal homesteaders again. Good good stuff, man. I love that. Yeah. When I did it, yeah, when I did it, I actually built. I took and ran off the side of my garage. I built like a little lean-to. I took two by fours and made some some rafters mm -hmm. dropped it down and attached it to a privacy fence on the other side then i just lined the inside of it with with tarps to keep the or just some plastic really just to keep the wind from cutting through there um got fans up in there i hung them on each side of this little lean to i got a nice little walk through i got me a grow out cage uh, a little uh, pin in the back and that worked great you know and i've raised quail and rabbit in there but i really when i first started doing it I was doing it in colony and, and which has some great advantages, but also has some disadvantages and it actually not being the best way for me. Well, what I did love about it was the freedom it gave the rabbits to kind of be rabbits and to kind of intermingle a little bit. Well, for me, the, the compromise was running tractors and then I started putting them in tractors and moving them around every day and they still got to get on the ground, do their thing but it kept them contained better and I could control the breeding. I could put the bucks with the bucks and the does with the does. And, and when I wanted to breed them, I could bring them together and it just made a better way, you know, and they wasn't always on the same ground. So I was having less disease issues. I could move them, uh, keep the ground fresh. So they wasn't just, you know, kind of in their own manure all, all the time. And, and, uh, it done. It, it was a good mm -hmm. compromise for me. So I try to do that in the, in the, the months that I can do it, get them back in the cages in the winter time. But then when, you know, sp springtime gets here, it's back in the tractors, which I really like doing and it cuts the <laughs> feed costs. It just, there's so many benefits to that, that I love it. Um, but yeah, hardy animals, Oh yeah, uh, all, all kinds of just benefits to them for sure. Uh, I like the, uh, the tractor model for, for rabbits. I mean, if folks don't know what that is, I mean, it's just a mobile rabbit pen, usually mm -hmm. without a floor, but you move around so that yeah. they stay on fresh, clean ground and they, they get a lot of their own fodder that way. Um, it w it's not the best option for me because we have a lot of uneven ground. Well, so, I mean, I, I have a tractor for my chickens that I use around the garden area, but it took me a while to flatten that garden area out enough so that I could put the chickens across there in a tractor once the garden's out. Yeah. Um, I don't have too much of an area where I can use that. I mean, even in the back, it's, there's a lot of ups and downs and little swales and it's not steep hills, but it's just kind of lots of ups and downs. Yeah. And I would have some trouble just keeping, keeping that kind of pen level enough that they don't start sneaking out the corners of it. Yeah, I did. Uh, so. I did 
I did put a uh, large square. It's a the two by four fencing on the bottom of mine, uh, two by four mm-hmm. inch square fencing, and that because that does a couple things. It keeps them from digging, but it also lets the grass. And, and it's just enough because you're not they're not standing on that like they would. You couldn't use something like that in a cage because their feet would get sore yeah. standing on. It. But you're setting them right back down on the ground, so they're able to stand on the ground, so it doesn't like cut their feet or anything. But it's just enough to kind of pick them up with the tractor, move them, set them back down. You do have to kind of watch their legs if you're going to use something that big. You can use like the one inch hardware cloth that way their leg can't go through it but yeah. uh, not as much grass will kind of stick up through it so there's kind of a it's kind of a trade-off i have built them with the one inch hardware cloth but the gra- they, they have a little bit harder time eating the grass and stuff with that um but if you use the i actually have a, a little in mine i have a, a section in the back that's got a hard floor in it and i will kind of herd them back in there into that hole and get them back into that it's kind of like a little hole for them to get into and hide and I'll kind of push them back in that, then pick them up, move them, set them back down. They can come back out on the fencing area. And um, it works pretty good uh, doing that. And that way I don't have to worry about them digging too much, you know, getting out getting out or anything. But also they can still get plenty of grass that way. I like that design with the with the solid kind of wooden box or wooden floors in the yeah, back. On, at the very back. Yeah, yeah. It's, like all, it's not a big area, but it's enough to hold. Just squeeze them in there. I'll kind of push them back and I have a little door on it. I'll close mm-hmm. and then I'll pick it up, move it, you know, kind of, walk, you know, drag it. It's got wheels on it. So I just kind of roll it to the next section, put it up, open the door, let them back out. They go it once they get used to doing that. They almost as soon as you come to them, they just go in there because they know it's going to happen. It's like they get trained to it. Um, but yeah, it, it works really well. Yeah. It's pretty nice. You have to clean that. I have a, a a lid that I can lift up on the top too, so I can clean that out because obviously it gets a little messy in there because it does have a hard floor in there. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, you get that benefit as well. I mean, you just gotta. It's all about design. It's kind of making something that fits your homestead. Some people just if you got nice level ground, you can drag them around. You can do that with chicken tractors too. But I have a lot of dips and and low spots in my yard too. So everything I'm building, I have hardware cloth or fencing on the bottom of it like that to even for the quail Mm -hmm. they won't dig out but you know they can get out pretty easy they're such a small animal that i put them in tractors also and they'll they'll find a hole and wiggle out if uh if you don't have something on the bottom because i tried it without anything on it and that happened a few times (laughs) or i've had had several times when uh, my chickens get out and i can't figure out how then i go and see yeah one corner was slightly up so i got to go and dig that dig the other end down and level it out a little and yeah well i've had uh, i've had raccoons dig into it also with the with the quail i had a raccoon dig under the what i was running them just on the ground and i had one dig under and get up in there and just had a heyday so that's Ooh, something you got to be concerned about too good. yeah no it wasn't it wasn't good i came out to a mess but um but a funny thing was he was still in there so <laughs> we got him <laughs> But uh, well, yeah, at least there's that. Yeah, I've never had I've out. never had raccoons yeah. dig. So yeah, he got well. He kind of lifted. It. He dug a little, but he mostly just lifted it. I think and got up under there. But yeah, he he, he dug under it enough to get squeeze. Once he started squeezing, it kind of just picked up, and he went under there and got up in there. So I started running the hardware cloth on him, the bottom of him after that for the quail too, and and that mm-hmm. worked out really well. So, um, yeah, that's good stuff, man. And I I agree that the rabbits are a great way to go. Of course, you got the pigs. And the chickens and everybody says, you know, chickens are the gateway animal. Uh, they are, but rabbits can be too, especially in certain circumstances. And I think you don't get the eggs, but as far as the meat tastes real similar and, uh, and you know, you don't have to incubate no eggs. Now, if you've got roosters and you got kind of this natural process going on, yeah, you can, you don't have to do a lot of work for chickens either. If you can get them kind of doing their own thing, but rabbits will do their own thing. No matter what you, you have to work at stopping it with rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to beat the productivity of rabbits. I mean, uh, it's not hard at all to get 85, maybe even 90 pounds of meat from one breeding pair of rabbits a year. That's that's nothing. So, I mean, if you if I was to look at um, nothing, five yeah. breeding does and one buck, five breeding does and one buck can get me as much meat in a year. It can get me a steer worth of meat, about yeah. 450 pounds of meat yep. in one year. And with a steer, that takes you about a year and a half before you get the animal big enough to butcher. I can do that in a year with five rabbits and on half as much feed or less yeah. than half as much. I, I At one point, I had it. I pretty much maximized my uh, what I could do here. And I had six breeding does and two bucks. 
and kind of alternating them. And I, I like having two just in case something happens to one. Cause, uh, I had a doe ruin a buck mm -hmm. one time, so yep. it can happen. Um, so I like to have that a couple can happen. Of, my, yeah. <laughs> my best buck, uh, died of heat stroke last year. I was pretty sad about that, but yeah, I try to keep a spare just in case, you know, they get sick or, or whatever a raccoon yeah. might get at him somehow or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's just nice to have a spare one. Uh, and, but I mean, I have friends locally that have mm -hmm. rabbits also, which is nice just having friends, people you could go and if you had to get one or borrow one, you could to get, keep the process going. But, and we, we produced a lot of meat that year. That was one year I really kind of maximized it. And I just kind of wanted to see what I could do. And I didn't keep track of the weights or anything. But I know it was more than I could eat. Uh, I keep up with eating. I mean, I was giving some away or trading some because I traded a guy for some pork. And I mean, I was I was working it out of this homestead because I had so much meat, so much rabbit meat. So you can produce a lot, a lot of of meat with uh, with that uh -huh. a handful of rabbits. Oh yeah, no doubt about it. And I just don't think people quite understand that uh, what you can produce. Um, it's kind of a forgotten meat, really. Uh, after. Yeah after the Cornish cross chicken kind of around the fifties or sixties got to be more common, you know, chickens took off and rabbits disappeared kind of yeah, yeah. like how sheep used to be so common. And now it's, now it's beef cows and nobody, nobody eats mutton anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But you go to other countries. I mean, yeah, rabbits still a, mm -hmm. a huge livestock in a lot of other countries, you know, which is here, we've kind of gotten away from it, but I think there's a big, kind of a resurgence coming back to it too because people see the value of the of the self-sufficiency of those animals the ease the ease of feeding them the, mm -hmm. the ease of care there are a few issues i mean there can be I, ear mites is something i've always battled with i mean i'm always treating rabbits for ear mites and, and it's just i don't know if you deal with that much but here it's huge um i've never actually dealt with ear mites once like i always watch really? it watch for them because i've heard so much about it yeah. and I've heard a lot of horror stories, but the only thing we've ever had is once in a great while, we get a bot fly or two mm -hmm. and, um, we get, we get that little kind of snotty runny nose that, that a bunch of rabbits can get sometimes. And then maybe one or two of the younger ones will die from that. When I was colony raising them, coccidiosis was my huge issue. I had a big mm -hmm. issue with the coccidiosis and I had a lot of them die. And it actually discouraged me for a couple of years. I got away from raising rabbits because I was like, I don't even, I can't even deal with that. And then I went to cages when I went back to raising them and it fixed that problem. But when you have them in a, in a colony on the ground in one spot, it tends to be an issue. Um, it can be an issue. And there's a new, there's a, not a new disease, but there's something else that was kind of hitting a lot of rabbits here a couple of years ago. I can't rem remember what it was called, but it, 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 I never had that issue. Um, but then like I said, near mites have been the only other issue I've had. So yeah, I mean, I've just, you know, some people will run into, um, they'll get some breeds and maybe, I don't know if it's from stress. It can be from stress or other issues, but you'll get a lot of breeding issues. Like they can't breed or, or they'll kill their, their, uh, kits when they're young after they give birth. I mean, you, you get some rabbits that get stressed out or get some, or the heat maybe issues, or they just feel threatened by predators and they'll just do things like that. So th there are issues and there is a learning process with raising rabbits. Oh but yeah. I think uh -huh. once you get it kind of squared away and you figure it out. It's pretty easy. I found out that, uh, my does do not like the chainsaw running near them at yeah, all. It'll stress them out. Uh, yeah. I actually, I had to stop using that for a little bit. Um, we just had a bunch of new litters of bunnies here and I noticed that they just weren't acting normal. They were, they, it looked like they were kind of losing or ignoring some of their instinctual habits and their mothering instincts a little bit, just really mm -hmm. stressed out. So I had to slow down with that for a while until yeah. their bunnies were a little bit older here. So yeah, we, we had uh, one doe. She used to be my very best, always had 10 or 12 healthy bunnies, a litter, but the past three litters, she just kind of stopped taking yeah. care of them. And I don't know what's up with that. I'm guessing it's just hormonal things just quit working. Right. And so mm -hmm. we, we cooked her up finally. We had a rabbit stew. <laughs> yeah. There just comes a point where they just stop being good moms. I've had several like that, that they just, they just stop, you know, and they're not good. Uh, like I said, I had a friend who uh, let his, he, he couldn't figure out what was going on with his. And um, it turns out he was bringing his dog out there. He started it, right about the time he started bringing his dog out with him. The dog would get aggressive and hit the cages and stress them out. And they got really stressed out by that. And they just stopped being good moms. I mean, they were doing, you know, like I said, they were either they weren't breeding. They just stopped breeding or they um, 
or they were killing their own kids. And it was because of stress of that dog. And he removed the dog, went right back to normal. Everything was fine. So it's just, you got to kind of figure out what that trigger is. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're just, they're an animal that yeah. they have a, they have funny instincts and, um, and, and with predators and, and just stress and I've, heat can do it yep. to them. Lots of things can do it to them. So they are sensitive in some ways, but in some ways they're pretty hardy too. So it's like, you just got to kind of figure out raising rabbits. It's a, it's a different, there's some things you do have to learn, but they're not that hard once you really get the hang of it. Yep. They're, they're a timid animal. So yeah. approach them a little bit slow and quiet. That's, that's what I've taught my girls is you have to be slow and gentle or slow and quiet when you're by the animals. Um, yeah. I mean, and I've said for years that the biggest um, health factor for any livestock is just stress. Anything oh, yeah. at all that that's creating this stress, stress is, it's, it's probably the same for people. It's just yeah. not as easy for me to observe it. But stress, if I, I see somebody who brings animals into a stressed scenario, I'm expecting that they're going to have a lot of health problems or just mysterious uh, behavioral problems and mysterious health problems show up just due to stress, be it noise stress, or maybe yeah. they're not getting fed and watered quite often enough, or maybe it's heat or too cold or something that's causing that stress. And then yeah. they just lose their natural behaviors. They, they ignore their natural instincts. And you get to know your animals. It's easy to tell when they're stressed out too. You can see it in their eyes. You can see it in their body. I mean, just their tense, yeah. how tense they are. You can just really tell when an animal's stressed out. If you get to know your animals well enough, you can see it. You know when there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that's oh, yeah. why I'm it big on all animals. So. Yeah, I'm big on just putting my hands on my animals every day. I, I think it's important to go out there and physically be with your animals every day. A lot of people want to set up a lot of automatic stuff and never go out there, and that's fine. But I still, I still think it's important to go out there and put a hand on your animals and know what's going on with them and kind of get to know your animals. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't treat them like pets. I never have. I mean, they're, they're, they're livestock, but I do get out there and I put a hand on them and I understand what's going on with them. And I want to read that animal and kind of just, you know, kind of just be with them and kind of understand them and you get to know them because you, you, you just, you know, things, you know, when there's a problem, when you do that and you can just kind of see things. Things. Yeah, that's it's it's an important deal. Um, both to calm the animal in your presence to make get them used to being calm around you. Uh, with with our chickens, the rabbits, with the pot belly pigs, you know, just just pat them on the back once in a while, or just just touch them gently, because it helps to calm and assure them in your presence. Yeah. Which I mean, that's always handy. You don't want animals that are going crazy when you go out there, yeah. but for the rabbits, especially our, the silver Fox have a real thick coat of fur. And the best way that I keep uh, tabs on their body condition is just by just hand on the back. And I just kind of feel a little bit, yeah. maybe feel the hips a little, or just feel for the backbone just to make sure I can see how they're doing. Yep. Yep. I agree. It's a good way to do it. And I think it's important with most animals. I mean, you really just want to physically check them out and just be there and, and you kind of understand them. And like I said, I I'm all for automating and making your job easy, but it still doesn't take away from the basic husbandry of just spending a little time with your animals. So you can uh, just always be paying attention to what's going on because you know, you can lose crops and you can have bad things and, and happen to your garden and your trees and whatnot, but nothing, um, will hit you as hard as when animals are sick and dying uh, and, and you're really wondering yeah. what's going on or, it, or especially if it's cause you didn't do something right. It will, it'll bug you. you know? oh, yeah. so I, I, everybody, every homesteader deals with that and it makes you want to quit every time. Yep. And, um, uh, yep. we, we had a, we had a hard winter here early on fall into winter with our animals. We lost a couple litters of, uh, bunnies, one of them, what just made me feel bad, uh, there was a little trickle of water that just happened to go just right and drip down the cage and it went right down into the nest. And the newborn, uh, they just got wet and they, they all got cold. We lost, I think, three litters of rabbits in about three weeks from that and various other issues all at once. And then I lost a whole litter of pigs, nine piglets, uh, about a month, two months ago, I think. Yeah. Because wow. I don't know if it was my fault or if, or if they just came early. Um, they came earlier, about two weeks earlier than the date I wrote down. So I wasn't prepared for them. I don't know if I made a mistake and wrote down the wrong date 
or if it was because my sows got in a fight the day before and that stress could have caused her to go into labor sooner. I'm not sure, but just it's a hard hit. You know, especially if you're trying to sell the animals, that was going to be a, a sale litter at, uh, we sell our, our pigs, um, for a hundred dollars. Once they get six months old, butcher them out, do custom processing. And I'll sell their 25 pounds of custom processed pork for a hundred dollars. And I mean, it's not a ton of money, nine piglets, but it's enough that it still bothered me because that's how we fund a lot of the operation that we're doing here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's hard hit. Yeah. And just, just the, the feeling it gives you, especially if it's something you feel like you did wrong. It's like, boy, that'll hit you, you Uh know, and, 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 you know, it makes you want to quit for a while. And and I've been there, like I said, with the coccidiosis that time I did stop for a couple of years. Cause I was like, I don't know what's going on and I don't feel adequate to, to keep raising these animals just to watch them die. You know, it just makes you feel so bad. And that's okay. I yeah. learned a little bit more about it and I thought, okay, it seems like this is the problem. Maybe doing them in this colony setup. And so many people are big proponents of colony raising rabbits. I'm like, that's great. If you can do it and it's not an issue for you, you should do it. It was an issue for me. I it just, there's something in the ground here. It was just, they were, they were catching it and I couldn't stop it. And, um, you know, I had to go to cages and then eventually I went back to tractors and I've not had that issue in tractors where I had it when I was colony raising them kind of in a pen area where they were in that same pen all the time. Um, but yeah, you just feel, yeah, I wouldn't feel personally really colony raise, but I, I, I do cages and tractors would be all right. If I could make them work, I don't yeah. personally, I mean, I don't raise my pigs in a permanent pen scenario either. I yeah. constantly move them around a little less in the winter when everything's frozen, but I like to, in the summer, warm months, I'll, I'll move them a minimum every two weeks. I try to move them, move their pen at least once a week just to keep, keeps them healthy and happy. It keeps the ground healthier and cleaner. Uh, I don't have any smells in the animal pens when I move around a lot and the, the parasites aren't really an issue if I move just once a week. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, that's why I think the, the paddock structure, the movable paddock structure is a mm-hmm. really a good idea for, for any animal. I mean, I see it with cattle and pigs and just all kinds of animals. And it seems like it's a, it's a good idea in pastures to really move oh, yeah. those animals around. It's good for your land and it's good for the animals. Uh, so for my pigs, um, they're in our front yard right now, which is fairly level. So I've got uh, hog panels that I'm moving around in little mini paddocks. Looks like Rachel, Rachel's going to join us here. <laughs> Then in the backyard, it hog panels aren't going to work back there because it's just too uneven. There's no way I can. Yeah, they, they don't work. A 16 foot straight panel is going to be sticking way up in the air on one end. So I'm planning on doing um, electric netting back there. I'm actually going to I'm going to be fencing in the back with a single strand electric. And then I'm going to be tagging into that for my electric netting so I can have a 50 foot pen that i'm going to be constantly moving around the backyard in a paddock scenario yeah that's a that sounds like a really good idea well hey rachel welcome to the podcast (laughs) (laughs) better late than never is your mic plugged in i'm not sure it is sounded like you're pretty far away (laughs) yeah yeah i think paddock uh, moving moving paddocks or being able to shift your animals in a pasture is um yeah, like you said, it's such a it's such an important thing for the land management, such an important thing for just mm-hmm. the livestock management. I, I mean, Joel Salatin really kind of um, perfected the model. I feel like it, with his, you know, how he moves his, he does it with the with multiple animals. He does it with the cattle. Then he'll bring the chickens in behind them, and then you know he's he's kind of just always moving mm-hmm. things and keeping it keeping it fresh. And I just think, and he ends up with a really great product. He re- ends up with just really high quality soil, high quality pasture. Um, I've heard him talk about, uh, the amount of, uh, feed he gets off of a pasture is so increased because he does that. And it's just this constant fertilization, uh, and, and not over abusing the land as far as just taking it down to dirt. You see these pasture lots everywhere where they just, they just take it down to bare dirt. And then, and then that's why they're dumping mm-hmm. the grain in there because there's nothing else to feed them, but the grain they're bringing into them. And it's just such a bad model. Unfortunately. And I mean, I hate to admit it, but most pastures are well overgrazed and, you know, well overused. And, and I, I get why it's simple. You know, if you're going to have these animals, you, you put them out there and you don't think about them very often. 
I mean, it, it's very simple. And yeah. when you when you get to managing pasture a lot more, one of the big parts of managing pasture, most people understand that is that move them around, you know, rotational grazing to some effect so you don't overgraze, but that takes more time. The more you do it, the more benefit it has, but it takes more time, a little bit different infrastructure, not necessarily more infrastructure, just different. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the big things is, yeah, I guess for, for most people, it's just they view such a traditional mindset of things that you, you, you put your cows out in the pasture and you ignore them for a while. <laughs> but when you start managing things on a higher level, you increase the, the amount of what you can do with, with your land. And on small land, that's a necessity. It's essential to be able to take this one acre that I have and my half acre back pasture, and I'm turning that into more than enough land to put about four liters of, of my small hogs back there constantly running around. We'll have four litters this year and I'm going to do rotational grazing with them back there. And I'm not going to let it get overly grazed. That might mean you dealing with pigs, they tear up the land a lot. So that might mean I have to do a little seeding of something like maybe some grain, some, some wheat or some oats, something like that to bring it back. I'll find out. Yeah. But just even just so that you don't take more out of the land than you're putting into it which is, that's the biggest deal for me, you know, with a lot of the, with the hay fields, with the, the grazing pastures, you don't want to take more out than you're putting into it. I think a lot of it is to the farm model versus the homestead model. If you have a 20 acre farm yeah. versus a 20 acre homestead, mm -hmm. where you're going to put maybe three or four cows on seven or eight acres, you don't have to worry about that. You can just stick them out there. You're not going to rotation. Now, if you're wanting to really it, yeah. make that intense and get as much production out as possible. Then that's when you have to start really thinking about your shifting and your moving and your paddocks and, and things like that. If it's just a homestead model where you just want enough to feed your family and you just want to put them out there, you can do that. And you're not going to overgraze the area. You're not going to hurt it. You're going to, it's going to be good. And, and, and you're not going to kill anything. Probably they're going to just kind of browse around and just take bits here and bits mm -hmm. there and do their thing. So it's just a different model really. Any I wish I had that kind of space. I'd yeah, it'd be nice. When, yeah, with rabbits, we got that kind of space. But when you start thinking cows and pigs, it's a different. It's different. Any thoughts on that, Rachel? Since you just joined in here kind of late. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm joining in kind of late. I kind of uh, saw the time wrong on them. <laughs> it's all good. Email. You're you're going to be doing some of that on your property. You got that 20 acres. You're talking about at some point bringing in more for probably homestead model animals. Um, yeah, yeah. We're I don't we don't have a lot of area there that will serve us well for like a pasture, but we'll probably be rotating through the woods and stuff like that. Yeah, but, um, yeah. we only plan on using a part of that property. The rest, because we really don't need it after being on such a small space here on a third of an acre and seeing what we can do with a third of an acre if we manage it well with rotating. We don't have animals, but rotating crops and stuff. We just know that we have so much more. You can do so much with such a small spot right. that we don't need to use all of it mm -hmm. for that. Yeah. 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 Well, like we've all proved that I'm doing it, you know, on a, you know, quarter acre you're doing it on a third acre. He's you know, Jordy's doing it on one acre. Um, people really, I think, uh, it, it, no doubt having that extra acre is nice, especially when you're dealing with large livestock. But uh, we've all proven that you don't need a ton of land to homestead yeah. and to feed your family and to feed. And as Jordy's mm -hmm. proving to even feed your livestock, you just don't need a ton of space. You can do a lot with very little. Yeah, so. you can. We're still planning on at some point getting more land, getting another mm -hmm. 20 acres. But I have my eyes and my goal is set on uh, more of making a living from what we're doing, too. So yeah. that's part right. of that. Yeah. 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 If, if you're wanting to. Again, it just, it's however big you want to scale. If you're just looking to feed your family, you know, you can do a ton in a small space. If you're wanting to turn it into a full business and depending on what, even what kind of business you got. I mean, if you wanted to grow some high quality crop, you could probably even do it on an acre and make a living. But if you want to get in, if you're wanting to get into livestock, I know things, no guys who do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I do too. And, and, you know, so you can do it even on a small lot. Um, but you know, if you're going to, if you're going to try to do it with livestock, it takes more land for that kind of a, a setup. And it just depends on what you want to do. 
and um, you can make it work. Uh, Like I said, I I know some people that I would say that they're making a full-time living from their homestead. Now, it's a little unconventional how they're doing it because they are selling some stuff from their homestead and they're doing it on, you know, very small acres. I mean, like one I know has got like a half an acre and they're making a full-time living off that half an acre. Wow. But they're selling really high-end crops. They're doing microgreens and selling those in their area. And they're doing it online and they're doing online business. They're doing like blogging and, and things like that. And all of that I consider is their homestead because that's what they're talking about. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's a homestead business. All of it is and they're full-time living. So it doesn't, there's, it just got, you got to think out of the box a little bit, maybe on what you can do, but it's not even impossible on a very small lot to make a full-time living as a farmer yeah. homesteader, uh, you know, but it does in a lot of ways get easier with a lot of acreage and, and Depending on well, what you're going to do, yeah. also. And I think what gets easier with a lot of acreage is sustainability. It can be. So yeah. we're looking mm-hmm. more at like we are we're looking at having a wood lot so we can feed the wood stove, and that is yeah. harder to do the smaller you have with a piece of property. Right. Yeah. 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 And Jordy, you're dealing with a lot of that. I mean, you it's you easy. have one acre, but you have a wooded lot. Manage, you know, when yeah. you have more space. Yeah. One of the things I've always wanted to get into more is uh, the seed business, uh, oh. garden seed and some crop seed. Mm-hmm. I've played into that, played with that a little bit. Um, I may or may not have a deal mostly worked out with MI Gardener. I still have to finalize some of that That's to grow some seeds for them. Oh, that wow. That is so cool. But I would really love to um, get more into having my own, own branded uh garden seed business something i really love growing for seed and saving seed yeah. and it's one way add and i can only handle so much while i'm already working 60 hours a week away from home <laughs> but that's one of the one of the revenue streams that i want to have developed it's in the within the next year or two i want to start um, selling some garden seed mm-hmm. whether that be on my website or i'm not sure quite how i'm going to pull it off but i want to I want to start selling some seed. The, I love growing things to sell, but I hate shipping. I hate it's such a pain. I hate shipping. <laughs> it's the biggest struggle with me selling things. I just hate doing the whole shipping thing. I hate dealing with the mail yeah. and stuff. It's just a pain. Especially if you're doing a lot of small all little packages. Yeah. So yeah. I was oh, yeah. thinking probably to keep it simple, do something like um seed kits like maybe have a a feed crop seed kit, maybe, maybe a Mm -hmm. tomato seed kit and just do like five to 10 different things together and have less options. See how that goes. Maybe I'm not sure. That sounds like it would streamline a little bit better. I used to work for a homeschool company and ship books. So I did a lot of shipping and Mm -hmm. it it, streamlining is definitely the way to go. (laughs) Yeah. Because it's a lot easier. Yeah. I, when I was doing, uh, I was doing a lot of comfrey and some other stuff I was selling at one point, comfrey, comfrey cuttings and stuff. And I got the little scale and I got the online stuff and I'm doing it all in here. And I made it about as streamlined as I could get. And I still didn't like it, but you know, it, for some people it's just a pain, but you know, maybe the problem was the boxes were just still a little bit too big to where I couldn't just drop them in a box. I had to take them into the post office and then deal with those people. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, Oh, I wish I was just a little bit smaller so I could fit it through the slot on the mailbox out, you know, but I, it was just a little bit oversized and i was like okay it just become difficult but yeah there's there's ways to make it better um some people love it i mean some people just love to do the mail business you know mailing things when i'm i just just yesterday i ordered some uh, well somebody listens to the podcast a few podcast episodes ago i was talking about wanting to get started with some water chestnuts right i said i can't find them anywhere though mm-hmm. So a listener emailed me and said, Hey, they got him at Seed Savers Exchange. This one guy's got him there. So I went on there. He sent me the link. I go on there. And, but when you go there, it's like everything, some people will take PayPal, some people don't. So it's like, okay, mm-hmm. well, mail me a check for this amount of money and then I'll mail you. And it's like, oh man, I got to deal with the mail and do all this stuff. Can I just like click a box and hit PayPal? <laughs> PayPal and you just send it to me. Nope. I think the way it works there, we got to do it this way. I got to mail this to you. You mail this to me. It's like, okay, it's worth it though. Cause I really, really mm-hmm. want these water chestnuts. I want to get those going on my property, but yeah, it's just, I, I'm a, I'm a victim of, uh, modern technology i i just want to make things as easy and streamlined as possible <laughs> i hate packaging up stuff and yeah. sending it. 
Yeah, I think any way that as homesteaders, farm small farmers that we can find to um, make some kind of a living off of our property is, and my daughter and I were talking about yesterday little ideas that we had and we were tossing around. So, but I think mm-hmm. um, it just all helps in it. I mean, I know I would lo- one day love to not be working outside of my homestead. My husband would too. So <laughs> yeah, that's but, cool. That's really cool. You know, and, and something I really admire you for Jordy is that, you know, it kind of goes back to the old adage that a penny saved is a penny earned. And you're really good at being frugal and not yeah. spending money on things you just don't need to spend money on. And yeah. the, the reality is you don't have to make a lot of money if you don't spend right. a lot of money. And, right. and so it's really, it's a that's, lot that's easier. That's true. Yeah, it's a lot easier if you don't go into debt or you don't have a lot of stuff. If you just make do with what you have, yep. it's amazing. You don't need to make as much as you think you do to make a decent living. So it's kind of like these farmers, yeah, these monocroppers, still- you know, they have to make so much money buying these quarter million dollar combines and all this equipment <sighs> right, and all this stuff. Right. They could probably make just as much money with 10 acres if they did it in an organic way. <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing yeah, the, that's, the difference you get. Yeah, I still don't have a track or or a farm truck and i mean everybody keeps telling me i need to go buy a tractor just for moving clearing my trees out but that just does not make any sense i mean <laughs> it can it can make there's sense a lot of advice people, people yeah. throw out there and yeah, yeah it's just it, it would not be wise for me to spend thirteen thousand dollars on a compact tractor to use for this spring and then i don't need it again but i yeah. guess a lot of people yeah. think i should so yeah and if you can, if you can stack know. functions and make do with the, your minivan to, to do the work mm-hmm. around there by hauling stuff and whatnot, or even buy a cheap little trailer to pull behind. It's hey, working. You know what? It's working. It, yeah. And to me, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's really a permaculture concept. It's, it's stacking functions, you know, it's like using this one thing for several things, you know, I mean, I've used, I've used a car like a truck many times back before I ever had a truck and, and, you know, and when you don't have a, or, or you buy a little trailer and you, you, you know, a couple, two or three different kinds of trailers instead of two or three or four different kinds of vehicles, you know, you can do that kind of, and save a lot of yeah. money. And, oh, yeah. you know, it's just a matter of, of make, you know, making do and saving a lot of money. And I don't do, mm-hmm. think we even really intended to go down this path, but that's something I really admire about you, the way you do your homestead. I mean, it's like, like I said in the beginning, it's not about keeping up with the Jones and there's a lot of that in homesteading. There's a yes. lot of that in homesteading. Yeah. The, there's a lot of that everywhere, but <laughs> yeah. all that does is, is it's a stumbling block. It gets in the way and it keeps you from doing things very well. You know, yeah. it, it's hard to have a good time with it all too. When, when you're, you're trying too hard to uh, keep up with the neighbors or, I mean, you're, you're working on, you've got truck payments and tractor payments and trying to figure out how to build a nicer shed or three thousand dollar chicken coop like they're trying to sell here in town it's it's it just gets built up so quickly and then you kind of lose lose the goal of what you were trying to do in the first place yeah and and the internet social media doesn't help with that either it's like we you know and we're all bloggers all three of us are bloggers and we talk about that before we let you go here in a minute jordy but we're all bloggers and part of blogging is you're trying to get information out there and you're taking pictures of your stuff and you're wanting to make it look nice and for the picture and whatnot. But I mean, so it's easy to get in that trap of, you know, spending mm-hmm. too much money trying to make things look a certain way. So people like it. And, you know, cause as bloggers and as people on social media, we, we want to present well, you know, so it's easy to get in that trap as well. I mean, you could def- definitely fall down in that rabbit hole and go that way and end up costing you money while you're trying to even make some money doing the blogging thing or whatever. So, um, yeah, it's an easy trap to fall into. Yeah. What is the, what is the saying? Good enough is perfect. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it works. If it works, Absolutely. it functions, then that's what you need. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And and you can make pictures look good without spending a lot of money as far as showing off what you got. So, um, before we let you go, Jordy, I know you got to go to work here. Uh, so you're gonna have to jump off here in a minute, but, uh, tell folks about your blog and what you're doing online there in your, in your YouTube channel. I've noticed you've been pretty active on that as well. Yeah. It's hard hard to stay active on youtube for that's that's just that's kind of the lowest end of my totem pole there me too and so when i don't have much time i cannot keep up on youtube but i do try so i have my youtube channel know how which is just 
just practical, applicable information for various homesteading skills. And then my blog, which is northernhomesteading.com. And it's, it's just homesteading information from gardening to animal husbandry from a very practical, uh, doable viewpoint and with more of a family type atmosphere to it all. Yeah. Well, you have a great blog and I really enjoyed your, I've been watching a lot of your YouTube videos. I liked you when you yeah, took I the tree know. down. I'm going to have to go, I'm going to have to go watch and read. I, I watched you uh, fell a tree with an ax and that was pretty fun to watch. <laughs> you look like you got you a nice workout on that one video, dropping that tree. That was a pretty good sized tree to drop with an ax. Yeah. Uh, I think that one was about a two foot wide tree. That was, <laughs> I think that was a, that might've been a poplar. So it would have been an easier one. Yeah, but, yeah, it looks like it was chipping away pretty good, but still a lot of work there. I, I know she had to take a sharp break axe is impressive, though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, you're doing a good job, man. And it was that good, was good stuff. You're that's making. actually, I think that's the tree that I actually slipped and hit my foot with the axe while I was cutting it. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I, had, I had felled about 10 trees already, and I was getting way too tired, and I made a sloppy swing, and it kind of ricocheted off and the tip of the ax stuck me right in the foot Ooh. and the Ooh. front of my foot's still numb from that. Uh, wow. So I got to, yeah, a little nerve damage there. Yeah. You need some, uh, steel toe boots. It sounds like <laughs> safety. Equipment well, that doesn't important. help if you miss the steel toe. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Get your, get your actual foot there instead of the toe. Yeah. But, uh, wow. Yeah. Be careful out there, man. Yeah, there is some danger in using, uh -huh. uh, oh yeah. Using some certain tools and and getting yourself too tired doing it too. There's definitely some. Maybe we'll have there, to so. have an injuries podcast one day. <laughs> I I could qualify for that. I've hurt myself a few times. I yeah, fell we, off ladders yeah, and all kinds of stuff around here. We've had several mishaps. Yeah, axes and chainsaws are the most dangerous tools you can work with. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. And, and animals. People, people understand that with chainsaws, but people don't really think about axes as being all that accident prone. So and, that and. and don't work with dangerous tools when you're tired. And ladders you know, too. I'll put ladders in there. I bet day. more. I bet more homestead injuries yeah. happen with ladders than anything. I have a friend that had to have knee surgery because I of have a, cow. a very rickety old ladder. <laughs> yeah, and I have a friend who fell out of a <laughs> yeah. ladder and uh, hurt himself up, broke a couple of ribs, and he was up pruning a tree. Matter of fact, he ended up in a tree and he didn't have now, it stable and went down. Yeah. Speaking of axes, my husband Ooh. has a small piece of axe in his forearm that they wouldn't remove when it. It's a crazy story, but he has a small piece <laughs> well, of we'll axe in his sometime. forearm. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Be careful out there with them tools because they <sighs> can hurt you. No so kidding. We'll, well, Jordy, no we'll let you go. I will get your, uh, I'll get the links to your, uh, your website, <laughs> your YouTube channel in the, in the show notes again. And I appreciate you coming on and also appreciate, uh, you know, you've been really active in the homestead front porch in there yeah. answering questions and, and sharing information. And man, I really appreciate that. You're, you're, you're yeah. a benefit to the, to the group. And, I like uh, to help where I can. You've been great and I appreciate it, man. And we'll have you on again sometime, man. You're, you're, you're turning into family here. Cool. We enjoy Sounds having good. you on. <laughs> All right, man. <laughs> well, we'll catch you All later. Right, I, I got to run. All right. See you. Looking around, I find the sea. I think I need a change. The rat race, I want to flee. My world, I'll rearrange. I'm getting back to the roots of how it's meant to be. Growing gardens, picking fruit, racing livestock, living free. It's a Like grandma did, sitting on her front porch, hunting and fishing like a kid. Once you've done all of your chores, it's a modern homestead. Build a modern homestead. Country or city, there's a way to make this change. You got. Today.